Hello everybody. This is Dr. Jyoti Lakshmi from Government Arts College, Karo. I welcome you all for today's video on small scale reflections on a great house by A. K. Ramanujan, the sixth poem in Unit Three from the book Concord Two. Let's start with an introduction to the poet. Attipat Krishna Swami Ramanujan was born in 1929 and raised in Mysore. He is famous for his poetry, both original and transcreational. Transcreational is translated from other languages. He has translated from Tamil and Kannada into English. His translations include 15 Tamil poems, the interior landscape, which was awarded the gold medal of Tamil Writers Association. Speaking of Sukha, which was nominated for the National Book Award, Sanskara. Poems of Love and War and South Indian Folk Tales. He also wrote the literature of India and Introduction, Striders, written in 1966, and Relations, written in 1971, or his two collections of poems in English. His awards include Padma Shri by the Government of India and Mac Arthur Award. Small Scale Reflections on a Great House was published. In a second volume of poems entitled Relations, to comment on the structure of the poem, it consists of 91 lines. It is 28 stanzas with three lines each, comprising 84 lines, and a line after every fourth stanza, which accounts for seven lines. The mood of the poem is. reminiscent or nostalgic reminiscent is going down the memory lane and recollecting to bring your memories back nostalgic is longing to go back to the past so this is the mood of the poem i'll read out the poem to you small scale reflections on a great house ak ramanujan Sometimes I think that nothing that ever comes into this house goes out. Things come in every day to lose themselves among other things lost long ago among other things lost long ago. Lame wandering cows from nowhere have been known to be tethered given a name encouraged to get pregnant in the broad daylight of the street. under the elder supervision the girls hiding behind windows with holes in them and with library books usually mature in 2 weeks and begin to lay a row of little eggs in the ledgers for fines as silver fish in the old man's office room breed dynasties among long legal words in the succulence of victorian parchment neighbors dishes brought up with the greasy sweets they made all night the day before yesterday for the wedding anniversary of a god never leave the house they enter like the servants the phonographs the epilepsies in the blood sons in law who quite forget their mothers but stay to check accounts or teach arithmetic to nieces or the women who come as wives from houses open on one side to rising suns or another to the setting accustomed to wait and to yield to monsoons in the mountains calendar beating through the hanging banana leaves and also anything that goes out will come back processed and often with long bills attached like the hooped bales of cotton shipped off to invisible manchesters and brought back milled and folded for a price cloth for our days middle class loins and muslin for our richer nights letters mailed have a way of finding their way back with many redirections to wrong addresses and red ink marks earned in thiruvella and silkot and ideas behave like rumors once casually mentioned somewhere they come back to the door as prodigies born to prodigal fathers with eyes that vaguely look like our own like what uncle said the other day that every plotiness we read is what some alexander looted between the malarial rivers a beggar once came with a violin to croak out a prostitute song that our voiceless cook sang all the day in our backyard nothing stays out 
daughters get married to short-lived idiots. Sons who run away come back in grandchildren who recite Sanskrit to approving old men or bring betel nuts for visiting uncles, who keep them gaping with anecdotes of unseen fathers or to bring Ganges water in a copper pot for the last of the dying ancestors rattle in the throat. And though many times from everywhere, recently only twice, once in 1943 from as far away as the Sahara, half gnawed by desert foxes and lately somewhere in the north a nephew with stripes on his shoulders was called an incident on the border and was brought back in plane and train and military truck even before the telegrams reached on a perfectly good chatty afternoon. The title says small scale reflections on a great house. Small scale is uh, the minute details they are called as small scale reflections or memories. So living in America, A.K. Ramanujan is thinking of his traditional house in India. When he thinks of the traditional house, many minute details come to his mind and he has jotted down everything in this poem. So the personal life of A.K. Ramanujan or even we can say his traditional house is universalized in it. When he writes the poem, it's a modest and realistic expression and he is not boasting about the accomplishments or the achievements that the family has. It is divided into four stanzas, so I'll teach every four stanzas, all the 28 stanzas and explain it to you. The first four stanzas. Sometimes I think that nothing that ever comes into this house goes out. Things come in every day to lose themselves among other things lost long ago. Among other things lost long ago, lame wandering cows from nowhere have been known to be tethered, given a name, encouraged to get pregnant in the broad daylight of the street under the elder's supervision. The girls hiding behind windows with holes in them. The poet brings before our eyes the picture of a great house related with his early childhood and he chiefly talks about two things in the poem namely things that enter the house but stay forever and things that go out but inevitably return with a change. The poet says that whatever comes into the house never goes out. The entire poem rests in the shade of a family tree and the house becomes a symbol of a vast joint family. The house has got a bizarre nature, bizarre is peculiar or very strange. That strange nature is that whatever that comes in never leaves. He says things come in every day, every day new things come into the house but those new things get completely lost into the things that came earlier. Maybe the poet tries to say that the house has got a magical power to hold anything that comes inside it so everything stays there. So the new things get piled up with the old things that are already there. So the historic continuity was maintained. The past ran into the present. Then he proceeds to say what are all the things that came in and stayed in the house. The lame wandering cows. Wandering cows or stray cows, roaming cows. So nobody knows from where it came. He says wandering cows from nowhere. So those cows when they enter the compound they have been tethered. Tethered is to be tied to a pillar or something. So when, when an unknown cow enters the house, they tether it, they tie it and it remains in the house and it has been given a name as though it belongs to them. So it was given a name and it was even allowed to become pregnant or you can even say it was encouraged to become pregnant in broad daylight. The elders in the house 
supervised the entire operation so carefully that it would not be seen by the girls in the house but the irony is that the girls watch it through the holes in the window so when he proceeds to talk about the girls hiding behind the windows and seeing through the holes in them the poet is a bit ironic is not only ironic he is mocking at the taboos in indian society taboos or restrictions imposed by religion or society so in our society we are not approved to do certain things we are not allowed to see certain things so they are not allowed to see this process the cows becoming pregnant but the irony is that they see it through the holes in the window so he just mocks it the hypocrisy also not only the taboos but he mocks at the hypocrisy of indian society we say we don't do so many things so we are so particular in restricting ourselves from doing many things but actually we do it so he just uh, mocks at this hypocrisy also so in these four stanzas it starts with the peculiar nature of the house to keep everything that comes in he slowly proceeds to say, say what are all the things he talks about one thing in particular the lame wandering cows and as he proceeds he becomes the tone becomes a mocking tone and he mocks the hypocritical nature or the social or religious taboos prevalent in our country you can even notice the alliteration that is evidently seen he says lost long ago among other things lost long ago among other things lost long ago among other things lost long ago so in the second stanza you can notice this so he tries to say that whatever that enters the house loses its identity and it becomes one with what is already existing in the house the next four stanzas unread library books usually mature in two weeks and begin to lay a row of little eggs in the ledgers for finds as silver fish in the old men's office room breed dynasties among long legal words in the succulent of victorian parchment neighbors dishes brought up with the greasy sweets they made all night the day before yesterday for the wedding anniversary of a god now he talks about two more things in these four paragraphs first he starts with the library books that are borrowed by the members of the family so the borrowed library books were unread nobody reads it so the tone becomes ironic so so far it's a the tone was mocking it was mocking now it is ironic they take library books to read but they are unread so they usually mature in two weeks um, you the first sense that he uses the word mature is that when you take a library book usually you have two weeks to return it after two weeks you are supposed to return it so it gets mature in two weeks but he says the books mature in two weeks and begin to lay a row of eggs in the ledgers so books can never mature and lay eggs so first he says is that the books are unread though it is time for them to return the books the other thing he likes to say is that the books are neither read nor touched or dusted so they breed vermin which begin to lay eggs because of being untouched or dusted the vermin begin to lay eggs 
on them within two weeks. So legs eggs are laid within two weeks. In the books that are borrowed, then he says, in the office room of the great house, already there are many books. And in those books, you have silver fish. So silver fish, they are uh, insects that eat the papers. So silver fish, they breed dynasties of vermins. Already they have bred dynasties of vermins among the legal birds in the office room. So to this is added the library books, which are unread which also breed vermins that begin to lay eggs within two weeks. So when he talks about uh, the already existing book, uh, books, he talks about the material of the papers, the Victorian parchment. So the, they are vic the books are made out of uh, those Victorian period papers, which are very succulent. Succulent is which is very juicy and pleasant to eat or taste. So the silverfish is so fond of that juicy papers which are pleasant to eat and it has become a great dynasty. The silverfish has bred so many vermins that it has even become a dynasty like the dynasty of great kings or rulers. So these are also added with this. So they never go out. So all the library books, whatever that comes inside, all the books, they remain in the same place. Then the neighbors, they brought greasy sweets, sticky sweets that are made to celebrate the wedding anniversary of some god. So they were brought in dishes and those were never returned and they also become a part of the great house. So when he talked about the Android library books, he was ironic. But slowly when he comes here and talks about the neighbor's dishes that were not returned, he talks of the Indian custom of distributing sweets and sharing the happiness during festival time. So we can know about it through this. Then in the next four stanzas he says, Never leave the house they enter, like the servants, the phonographs, the epilepsies in the blood, sons-in-law who quite forget their mothers, but stay to check accounts, or teach arithmetic to nieces, or the women who come as wives from houses open on one side to rising suns on another to the setting, accustomed to wait and to yield to monsoons in the mountain's calendar beating through the hanging banana leaves. So in the first part he talked about the lame wandering cows. In the second part he talked about two things, unread library books and uh, neighbors dishes that were not written. So there are many other things which also enter the house but never leave the house. They are the servants, the servants who were employed during the father's time, they work even during the son's time, so they never leave the house. Then he talks about the phonographs, the record players or the gramophone records. Then he talks about the epilepsy, the disease that they have in their blood which is passed on from generation to generation. So this ironic tone now changes to pathetic tone or you can even say there is a touch of pathos when he says the epilepsies that run in the blood. So even that continues from generation to generation, it has stayed there in the same house. It has not gone out, the epilepsy, so it has passed on. Then this touch of pathos is slowly turned to 
be comical or the tone becomes comical when he says the sons in law forget their mothers so in indian tradition usually daughters in law go and stay with their in laws but sons in law they stay with their in laws with a purpose or a reason only with a purpose or a reason but here the sons in law they even forget their own mothers and they continue to stay in the house so they need a reason to stay here they want to justify their staying so the poet says they stay here to check the accounts of the family so they look after the accounts in the family or they teach the children in the family so he says especially teaching mathematics to their nieces then he talks about the daughters in law the women who came to this house as wives when he talks about those women he says they are from houses open on one side to rising sun on another to the setting sun so he what he tries to mean is that they are from houses which do not restrict their movement they are open to the rising and setting suns they do not restrict their movement but when they come and stay in the great family house they are accustomed or they are used to the restrictions on movement imposed in the great house seasons change but through all the seasons they are remaining indoors within the house so he talks about the setting the rising sun yielding to the monsoons that are beating through the banana leaves in the garden monsoons come seasons change but they do not go out they always remain in the house they are used to the restrictions on the movement so the daughters in law who come into the house they never leave the house they always remain in the house these are all the things that always remain in the house the stray cows the unread library books the neighbors dishes the servants the phonographs the epilepsies sons in law the women who come as wives in the family they never go out they always stay inside the house the house has got a peculiar nature or a bizarre nature to keep all these things inside so none of these things none of the people or the things that entered left the house in the next part he proceeds from the 40th line he the poet talks of another category of things which go out but always return with a change he says and also anything that goes out will come back processed and often with long bills attached this category of things they go out but anyhow they come back but when they come back they return with a change it is processed you cannot even sometimes identify what it is it looks very different and often bills are attached to the things that come so only the things go when it comes back it is processed it is changed and it comes with a bill like the hooped bales of cotton shipped off to invisible manchesters and brought back milled and folded for a price cloth for our days middle class loins and muslin for our richer nights letters mailed have a way of finding their way back with many redirections to wrong addresses and red ink marks earned in thiruvalla and sail coat the first thing he mentions is bales of cotton so bales of cotton were sent out of the house to manchester so it goes out as cotton but when it comes back it comes back in the form of cloth it is processed and made as cloth so it is in the form of cloth for various articles of dress needed by them like daytime dresses loins for daytime dresses and muslin for night dresses so this is how it comes back so it is changed cotton is changed to cloth 
and articles of dress with bills attached to them it is milled it is folded so price tag is attached it comes back the next thing is the letters which were posted by the people in the great house to their relatives in different places so letters which were posted to places like tiruvalla and soil court they were not delivered and were redirected to the great house when the letters were posted only the address was written on it but when it comes back that is also changed there are a lot of red ink marks on it when it is redirected so it comes with a red ink mark and ideas behave like rumors once casually mentioned somewhere they come back to the door as prodigies born to prodigal fathers with eyes that vaguely look like our own like what uncle said the other day that every plotiness we read is what some alexander looted between the malarial rivers not only things but even ideas that left the house came back to the house in the form of rumors sometimes they casually mention an idea but that also comes back in a changed manner in the form of a rumor when it comes as a rumor they cannot even identify that idea it is so changed so he uses two comparisons here to talk about the ideas that have turned into the form of rumors first he says they come back to the door as prodigies born to prodigal fathers here is a mention of the sons born in the family the sons born in the family or prodigal fathers they have left the house uh, they have run away from the house so they are very extravagant they are prodigal fathers but the sons who were born to them were unlikely they were not like the fathers they were all prodigies so prodigies are children who are gifted individuals who are highly talented and knowledgeable as children they are called child prodigies the fathers and the sons the the sons in the family the grandchildren in the family they have no similarity the fathers or prodigal fathers but the grandchildren or prodigies so like that the ideas that come back in the form of rumors or without any similarity then he compares the prodigal fathers and prodigies with another comparison he says they are very different they vaguely look like uh, the sons of this house so they are very different they vaguely look like the sons like what one of the uncles said the other day one of the uncles said that every plotiness we read is what some alexander looted between the malarial rivers actually alexander the great invaded india so when he invaded india so he came to know about the ancient indian writings when he went out of india he took the information from the great writings in india and philosophers greek philosophers like plotinus used the information relayed to them and cited it as their own when somebody read plotinus they appreciated the greek philosophical thought but actually that was looted from india by alexander the information was cited by the greek scholars as their own it the same it is like the same the prodigies and the prodigal fathers though they are the sons of uh, the prodigal fathers they don't bear any similarity people cannot identify they vaguely look like it in the same way information from great writings in india were used by philosophers like plotinus so these two comparisons are used to explain that the ideas that left the house also came back in the form of rumors 
A beggar once came with a violin to croak out a prostitute song that our voiceless cook sang all the time in our backyard. Beggars who came singing with their violin sang a prostitute song. Even that song stayed in the house or even you can say the beggars stayed in the house through the songs because the songs which were sung by them were remembered and sung by the cook who is employed in the house he sings it re re repeatedly in the backyard of the house and so even that song stays in the house or even the beggar stays there through his songs because of the repetition of the songs in the backyard of the house by the cook nothing stays out daughters get married to short-lived idiots sons who ran away come back in grandchildren who recite sanskrit to approving old men or bring betel nuts for visiting uncles who keep them gaping with anecdotes of unseen fathers or to bring ganges water in a copper pot for the last of the dying ancestors rattle in the throat now the poet proceeds to talk about the daughters the daughters who were married the they went they left the house as married women but when they came back they came back with a change they went as married women but returned as widows because they were married to short lived idiots the sons who ran away as boys from the house they got married and had children there is a reference to them in the previous lines about uh, the prodigal sons and their prodigy offsprings so the sons who are made uh, an earlier reference again he talks about the sons the sons came back to the same family but not as the same sons but as the grandchildren but the sons when they were in the family they did not do anything that is approved by the elders you notice the word approve approving old men but when the grandchildren come here they there is a change they were not like their fathers they did or performed various services for the elders in the family they recited sanskrit slogans which were approved by the old men there were many visiting uncles in the family and those visiting uncles kept these grandchildren engaged through the anecdotes about their unseen fathers so anecdotes or real life incidents so they told them all the real life incidents about their fathers who were not present there and the children brought betel nuts to the visiting uncles so they performed various services like reciting sanskrit slogans bringing betel nuts to visiting uncles and they even carried water from ganges river into the house for the dying people again here we can see a common ritual that is performed in india especially in brahmin families of which the poet is a part when the person is about to die when they are gasping for the last breath so they bring in ganges water to pour so that was brought by these grandchildren they brought it in a copper pot for the dying ancestors rattle in the throat uh, rattle is uh, some short sharp uh, sounds made through the throat recently only twice once in 1943 from as far away as sahara half not by desert foxes and lately somewhere in the north a nephew with stripes on his shoulders was called an incident on the border and was brought back in plane and train and military truck even before the telegrams reached on a perfectly good chatty afternoon we come to the last part so we have been discussing about uh, the various tones a uh, mocking tone ironic tone pathetic tone then comic tone so after all these towards the end the tone becomes tragic 
and emotional the poet talks about something that has happened many times from everywhere but he quotes to us only two recently occurred incidents it has happened many times from everywhere but he quotes uh, the recently happened incident uh, two two incidents first he says once in 1943 he talks about that in this stanza he says how certain family members go to war but come back even if they are changed they to come back changed even if they are changed they come back only to the great house so he says In 1943, from as far away as the Sahara, half gnawed by desert foxes, and lately somewhere in the north, a nephew with stripes on his shoulders was called an incident on the border, and was brought back. So, sometimes he says, the people from the house, especially the nephews, they go as far as Sahara. The poet tells the way one particular soldier was changed. So that is explained here. He was not by desert foxes. He was bitten by desert foxes. He suffered serious injuries, and then he talks about another family member, so who had got stripes on his shoulders. So he talks about um, the laurels he had won in the battlefield. So he had won many laurels, but he too. returned to the family he ultimately returned to the great house in the form of a corpse so brought back in a plane and train and military truck even before the telegrams reached on a perfectly good chatty afternoon the corpses are brought either in aeroplanes train or military truck one they have gone as far as sahara suffered serious injuries came back to the house they had won many laurels but ultimately they returned as corpses brought in aeroplane train or military truck the body in fact what he tries to say is in fact the body reached the family before the telegram notifying their death reached the house this is what i told you it is tragic uh, towards the end it is very emotional and tragic towards the end so such a return to return to the house in the form of a corpse he went out as a military soldier but came back with a change came back as a corpse such a return is tragic but he says it took place on a perfectly good chatty afternoon chatty you all know to chat so chatty is conversational cheerful uh, you have a uh, time to chat that is chatty afternoon usually uh, in indian villages on afternoons after the lunch people used to sit and chat they have a lively cheerful and pleasant conversational time so such are the afternoons in india chatty afternoon so though the body returns though it is a tragic return it happens only on a on a perfectly good chatty afternoon which is usual in the indian society usually the afternoons are perfect good and chatty poem finishes like this it ends with a tragic and emotional note though it changes though the tone of the poem changes so in the beginning in the even the title suggests the reminiscent and nostalgic mood then we had different tones ironic mocking comic so finally it is tragic and emotional so ramanujan has skillfully mingled all these things especially the comic and the tragic the tragic and the pathetic in this particular poem so this is for today's video stay tuned to learning english with jyoti and thanks for watching